Uh, so, <clears throat> I'd like to suggest to continue. If everybody is ready, so let's start. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, present you associate professor uh, of the Department of Hydrology, Faculty of Geography of Romanovs of Moscow State University, uh, Dr. Sergei Chalov. Uh, uh, he, uh, his research uh, interests uh, are focused on sediment quality and quantity and the remote sensing implications for sediment transport, uh, fluvial processes, stream ecology and biodiversity, transboundary rivers uh, research, uh, etc. Uh, he uh, is <clears throat> an expert uh, on rivers uh, of the Baikal, uh, like catchment uh, of the Kamchatka Peninsula uh, and uh, Arctic uh, uh, rivers. Uh, so, uh, Sergey, uh, please uh, begin. Uh, thank you, Mikhail. Dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, it's my pleasure to proceed with the second lecture in our uh, School for Young Scientists. And I'm very happy as, a, as one of the uh, co-organizers of this event. We are happy that it's got some interest from different research groups. And we see now in YouTube quite a good number of the uh, participants. And uh, actually, I would uh, generally change the direction of the uh, of the talk and firstly speak about. Uh, uh, so maybe I would go this way. Um, I would mostly speak about the rivers uh, which are not so urban as uh, uh, the previous speaker, as Bjorn said. But I would focus uh, on more natural state and I would explain why in the lecture, because uh, as far as we're focusing in the school on the uh, uh, pollution problems, but the natural rivers are very important. But before I would uh, focus to speak about the uh, research part of my presentation, I would briefly show um, again the photo for our university, which was also the first slide in the uh, Bjorn, uh, the previous speaker uh, presentation. And uh, here I would just uh, mention that we are uh, topographically the highest uh, faculty of geography in the world, since uh, uh, we are quite large and comparable to other faculties of geography or institutes of geography abroad. So you can see in these statistics, which are on the slide, that this is very big, uh, big institute and big education center. And uh, this word large, I would use for making a bridge to the topic of my presentation to the large rivers. So we working in the large uh, university in the large faculty of geography and we are studying the largest rivers. And here in this talk, I would uh, give um, five examples of uh, the research related to largest rivers across Siberia. And the case studies are distributed over uh, Yenisei, Len, and Kolyma catchments. And these uh, rivers, at least the three of them, the Op, the Yenisei, and Len, which you can see on the slide, these rivers are uh, typically called like uh, Russian Arctic pillars, meaning that they are, are standing up to push the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and so these pillars are the main focus of our interest. So that's uh, to give you impression of the small urban uh, creeks of uh, Dr. Helm is uh, the photo which is on the slide, this huge, huge river is big, uh, this um, turbidity um, uh, pathway on the confluence of two tributaries. And so you can see this as a matter of scale, the huge bridge which crosses this river. And this is so-called Yuganska Op. But the interesting thing that it is only a small part of the Op River. So actually, if we proceed on this photo to here to the left, we will see the are uh, actually the real Op, which is uh, almost six times larger. 
And uh, this is uh, the way uh, why we are talking and use this terminology largest or large as far as this huge uh, water um, stream on this on the photo is just the 15% of uh, the Op river. And so the um, uh, challenge is to talk about the large rivers when we especially focus on the pollution problems uh, and uh, on the issues related to, in some way, urban topics is the three points, which I would uh, talk in the introduction of my presentation. The first is the role of sediments. And here I wouldn't say a lot, and I even uh, skipped a few slides while listening to the um, uh, previous speaker, as far as the role of sediments as a key pollutant drivers is uh, rather obvious. And uh, we are uh, not uh, like, we would not talk about this in this lecture, but to um, provide enough evidences that we are interested in the um, looking into the large rivers sedimentation issues in relation to pollution problems, I would speak about a little bit about monitoring and about regional scope of this research. And uh, the only say uh, the only thing related to the um, uh, sedimentation is the key question in the hydrological or hydrogeochemical research. I would make a citation of rather famous um, uh, papers uh, uh, which uh, maybe give the best statement of the problem and uh, or make a, em emphasize that the sediments are integral and dynamic part of aquatic systems and the central role of it in the uh, research both from the ecological perspective what's also Bjorn said before and also from hydrological perspective and that's why there is a a um, big number of scientists looking on the sediments from different perspectives. And uh, so there is also many ways now to combine together the hydrology and geochemistry in these uh, questions. But here on the first slides, I would uh, also commence the problem of sediment research from the points of the monitoring and especially from the points of um, lack of the substantial uh, monitoring efforts and uh, so if we would look on the problem of the sediment transport or sediment pollution we will see that the um, that's the um, sedimentation itself is very fastly changing our parameter and factor but actually what we are having to learn about the sediments is very irregular measurements and very dense uh, stations, very dense gauging stations. Uh, from the point of view of the impacts that sediments have on the river system, we would uh, focus firstly on that it's the sediments are important source for heavy metals, nutrients and other pollutants. That's mechanically they are impair ecosystem and ecosystem functions. And that's very information, uh, very important information sources are needed to management decision. So together previous issues are added by the understanding that the hydrology and actually the sediment transports are fastly changed, not only due to urban pressures, but also because of the, let's say hydroclimatic development, if we would speak more in more wide perspective. And uh, if we look on the um, uh, reported in the literature values for these largest uh, Russian rivers, we would see that the, uh, that the trends in the sediment yields are rather huge for the last 30 or 40 years. And that's up to twice change in the sediment transport due to very different drivers are happening in the uh, areas on the north of Russia in these largest rivers. Uh, and that's why we need uh, to know, we need to have a new data on this new uh, state of the rivers. But also in relation to the uh, understanding of what is the sediment problem is from the perspective of our studies of pollution, there is very important thing that in Russia, uh, we have 
the large river of Russia is the reference of natural state and it's, it's like a field lab for Arctic or subarctic rivers to learn about fluvial process and sediment transport. And this is the reference of natural state is incredibly important if we compare Russian conditions to let's say Western conditions where the huge need to restore everywhere where it's, this is possible, a certain natural state of the river uh, is uh, important and is uh, uh, looking like a crucial step in the development of, uh, let's say, water management in general. And that's why the examples and their detailed analysis of the rivers are crucially important. And to prove this statement, I would uh, show this um, slide which shows the two rivers are um, in um, uh, Poland, uh, the largest river of Poland, Wisla River, which has uh, been um, changed its channel due to artificial uh, regulation during the um, all ancient, or not, not, not so ancient, historical uh, period of the development and it's became um, from the braided channel it's come to this rather uh, heavily straightened uh, regulated channel whereas Russian rivers are usually looked like a very broad and very natural big areas of water flow without any on the long reaches without any either population at all any settlements or without any specific regulation works which can be are seen like uh, are some impacts on the river course. And so from this perspective, uh, there is the needed to know this background or baseline conditions for the river systems. And this is the uh, best uh, area to learn about this uh, baseline condition is this largest rivers of Russia. Uh, but if uh, to summarize together what was uh, um, what was um, said in the previous slides, I would uh, again focus that even we are looking to the knowledge for the large ri Russian rivers, we are facing the big problem with the um, monitoring, which is not sufficient to uh, provide enough data sets for the um, uh, both hydrological issues, but especially for water quality or sediment issues and then uh, hence the scientists are looking for some surrogate techniques which are which can be used as the some proxy to study or uh, in our case the sediments and so one of these uh, approaches quite useful and well known for different parts of hydrology is the remote sensing and uh, on the next uh, couple of slides, I would uh, briefly describe how we can use the remote sensing to study this sediment flow uh, and what is the application of this approach for the large rivers. So actually the whole, um, so just make, I will add my, uh, So probably you, you have this uh, on the slide. Yeah, so if we look on the, um, some sort of the uh, <coughs> illustration of how their um, satellite images can be, give us information about their um, constituents in the water, we will see that the reflectance in different uh, channels uh, and depends on uh, and is based on the different uh, possibilities of these channels to to pass the water column and based on the um, uh, an, um, amount of material which is uh, suspended so dissolved in the river uh, the um, reflectance itself is changing and then we are we having the uh, possibility to go from the so-called digital numbers of the reflectance to the um, exact values of the uh, sediment concentrations. So, and in general, it is accepted that the our amount of the sediments in the water column affects 
the reflectance or the image values. And then, uh, especially in the red and infrared channels, the um, uh, relationships are rather significant. And based from these facts and uh, quite broad literature on the topic, we are uh, working on the general workflow of the Landsat uh, image processing system, which can be based on the collection of the images, which are um, also additionally studied in terms of the ground truthing. And the ground truthing in this way is the are um, simultaneous measurements of the sediment concentration in the surface waters uh, to build a relationship between the uh, between the sediment concentration and these uh, parameters of the image. So, and when we got this regression model, we can uh, add the rather big collection of the images and uh, from different years to come to the conversion of the suspended sediment concentration from the, uh, this relationship, which was done based on the ground truthing uh, and uh, deliver this, this relationship to the whole collection of the images and then to learn about the sediment transportation issues in the very long-term perspective and in the very special uh, diverse manner. So then, Monitoring station would never provide you sufficient information for the um, large um, areas about their um, any kind of sediment properties, and the specific field surveys are very um, expensive, and sometimes it's not possible to operate with them. And hence, the uh, approach of the ground choosing give us a novel design for monitoring of the sediment transport in the big river system. But to uh, confirm that we are on the right way, there is the need for several image processing options before the image can be used for the uh, sediment uh, studies. And here I would briefly comment the main steps of this uh, image processing uh, procedure. The first is the radiometric correction, which is done in a possible automatic way, uh, which gives us the correction from raw values uh, to reflect in coefficients. So we come to rather um, unique uh, relationship or unique parameters of the uh, images when we are making the radiometric correction. The second thing is the atmospheric correction. And we are in a sort of developed the technique which we call dark object. It means that the, we are looking for the water body on the image with uh, constant brightness. It means that this is, should be pure water without any sediments and in uh, many cases the lakes, uh, the lakes without any tributaries or the huge lakes like Baikal Lake, for example, which will be first in my talk mentioned a few times is the best uh, solution to make this, to apply this dark object technique. And then when we are taking with the, when we are working with the image where some sort of cloudy uh, impacts can be observed in, in the atmosphere, we should make a correction uh, like in the example we got here. This is the clean atmosphere and uh, here the atmosphere with some cloudy stuff. And then we can uh, need the correction of 0, 0 0.2 for the reflectance um, uh, coefficient, which means that we proceed to our, with the atmospheric correction. Then uh, there is, um, Back to what I already mentioned, it's the necessity to have the regional relationship between the, uh, the parameters of the um, sediment uh, concentration and the uh, image reflectance. So very briefly, I would just say that actually the hydrological so waves on the large river system is typically rather broad and I would use some of these uh, results in the further examples in my lecture. But uh, what we are really needed, so we can use the turbidity, which is fast procedure to measure quite 
large amount of the sediment concentration around using the also relationship with the suspended sediment concentration for each water body. And then from these uh, measurements, we can go to, uh, to calibrate the reflectance coefficient and to come to the regional uh, um, relationship with, uh, for, or for between the reflectance coefficient and the suspended sediment concentration. And actually the error, which is always the point in the, such kind of surrogate techniques is uh, rather important. And uh, we provide enough statements and in, enough evidences that uh, for different um, are images of different resolution, there is uh, the error up to 20% happens in the low sediment concentration values. And when we go to the high, higher levels of sedimentation, I mean, larger suspended sediment transport, the error can be decreased, but we have the sort of the upper boundary condition for uh, applicability of this method. And when we come to the sediment concentration upper than 500 milligram per liter, the relationship became not so strong and actually at some moments we lose the uh, signal or on the image from the different uh, turbidity or different sediment concentrations. So, but anyway, for typically 99% of the rivers, uh, it's quite reasonable parameter to work with, but uh, there is came another point that's the applicability of the remote sensing data is uh, the function also of the uh, river size. And this is the point which is uh, described on this graph. So here we have the resolution of the images. And this is the minimal width which uh, we assume that uh, uh, this uh, river can be used to study based to, to study the sediment transport issue based on the uh, remote sensing technique. So, and uh, let's say empirically, we came to conclusion that uh, the three pixel in the width of the river is uh, enough to uh, have a sort of the uh, high level of the consistency in the remote sensing techniques. So, and then we can upload different, uh, uh, we can, we did, we plotted different uh, is remote sensing or techniques to this uh, graph to see from which size of the river we can apply the um, different uh, satellite uh, images. And you see from the high resolution images, we slowly go to the large river and the Landsat itself is starting from something like 90 meters applicability of the, of the remote sensing. So, and here then we will talk about uh, the areas which are larger than that. And uh, like an example of what kind of data can be um, taken based on the are uh, these remote sensing techniques. There is the Selinga River on the example, which is uh, flowing from the Lake Baikal, uh, which is the, uh, no, not from the Lake Baikal to the Lake Baikal from Mongolia. And this is uh, the river, the largest transboundary river of the border between Mongolia and Russia. And the red dots are the images which were um, of the um, good quality. Uh, from the terms of the clouds and terms of the uh, special scope to uh, learn the sediment issues in the delta of the Selinga River. And you see that since the 1990 until the 2015, we have quite good uh, distribution of the images also which cover the extreme flow events and which cover the, the low flow events. So that's uh, just the, of course, the ice cover period is not possible to study. And then uh, there is uh, their idea to work with the sediment bullets is coming. And so I would, uh, as far as there's like half time of my presentation is uh, uh, flowing out. So I would switch to the case studies with the exact examples, what we can learn, what the scientists and their 
researchers can learn uh, from application of these uh, remote sensing techniques for the largest rivers. And I would start from the deltic areas of the largest tributaries of Lake Baikal. There is two big deltas in the Baikal Lake. It's the Selinga River and the Upper Angara River. So the Lake Baikal, it's not maybe the big or issue to talk about this largest freshwater pool of the world. And as the Upper Angara Delta is located in the, on the top, on the north of the Baikal Lake, here it is. And the, on the southwest is the, southeast is the uh, Selinga Delta, which also is famous like the uh, biggest uh, uh, freshwater delta of the world, interior delta of the world. And uh, for each of the deltas, we got the, this kind of mentioned before relationships. And then we are, after the calculations of the sediment budget along the main channels of the delta, and so the, we got seven uh, transects, which crossed the whole delta, and each transect was um, treated in terms of the difference between the sediment concentration on the output of the transects, for example, here, compared to the amount of sediments which are coming to the delta. And so the delta is quite large, it's 500 square kilometers, which is a um, quite big number. And uh, so that's, uh, we came to such kind of the picture which illustrates the seasonal variation of the sediment trans transport within this dirty environment. And so I will also say a few words why this is the issue of the research. The river brings a lot of pollution from their areas, also urban areas and uh, different mining activities, both in Mongolia and in Russia. And this is like a liver, uh, the liver of the um, uh, river um, system which clean or uh, name to clean the pollutants which are delivered to Lake Baikal. And so the typical in there are, it's um, that in the area of lack of the data, it's called that it's like a buffer area that's uh, constantly uh, decrease the sediment load. But the applicability of the remote sensing can give a new clues about how the system actually works and so, so on this graph, you can see that this is the discharge, the water discharge on the top of the delta. And this is the balance between the sediment concentration on the or budget on the output of the delta and then the, on the upper parts of the delta. And so we found that so on the low discharge, which is the left of the graph, we can have two possibilities of the changing along the whole system. In some cases, there is the longitudinal increase, which is called like erosion. So the sediment concentration is increasing to the uh, lake edge of the delta. And uh, in some cases, there is also deposition happens in this, uh, during these low water periods. But when we go to the uh, high discharges, to the floods, uh, upper something like upper than 1,500 cubic meters per second. In these uh, uh, hydrological conditions, the sediments are blocked in the delta. And this is quite evident that the situation is changed a lot. And then there is a question, low water we, are, have, we have quite higher uh, values of the uh, sediment budget. So it means that there is also a continual increase sometimes happens, but in the high water period, there is always a uh, decline of the sediments which are washed into, into the delta. And the quite evident answer is the sediment rotation during high water. So if we look on different our uh, hydrological uh, pathways of the water in the such kind of the flat uh, environment, we will see that there are a lot of water during the high uh, flood events um, go to the banks, flood the areas, the roughness is increasing and we come to have a lot of different uh, blockages in the system 
which are associated with these high level uh, discharges. So this is on the graph, you can easily see that uh, there is the wetlands itself became uh, much more um, effective in terms of the impacts of the influence on the river system. And there is a different sort of these blockages are happening. So the first is some bogs, the second is the lakes, and the third is just the flooding of the of the surface of the flat flat plain surface. And so in terms of the just pictures, this is what we usually know. In terms of the how the system works in general, so the, this kind of uh, statistical data is something something let's say new for scientists to see this seasonal formation of the sediment budget and. There can be other factors also discussed. And firstly, this uh, I'm talking about the possible impacts of the Baikal level fluctuations. And here on the graph, you can see the red is the discharge and the um, blue is Baikal level. And so we see that for especially low water conditions, when the Baikal level can be associated with rather high uh, levels, and uh, we have the blockage, uh, the back water effects in the downstream part of the delta, which can be the reason of the also the stop of the uh, flood delivery into the lake. But vice versa, there is also another point. It is the surges, so the wind which coming from the lake, in which can also affect the uh, secondary. Um, transports of the sediments which were previously deposited on the bottom. So, but anyway, the backwater effects from Lake Baikal should be considered. So I will skip the this last slide of the our previous case study and go to the third case study of, for my presentation, which is the on a branching channel of Lena River. And this is, we go to the north actually in the list of the case studies. And this is uh, the sort of what I have shown in the very beginning these huge and branching areas uh, of the natural Russian rivers where sporadically some settlements are located but you can fly over the Russian territory for a few hours and you would see no settlements and no roads only forest taiga and you will cross many such kind of rivers so it's the huge environment but it's uh, incredibly interesting in terms of the how the suspended load uh, is uh, transported here and based on the similar sort of application of the remote sensing techniques we discovered that there is actually the whole variability of the sediment transport can be um, uh, described by three main patterns so the first is the depositional which also happens during high water so we here i would just run forward, but we here also conclude the seasonality in the sedimentation system. So the depositional during the uh, high water events and so-called erosional, it means that we have the longitudinal increase of the sediment transport during the low water. And also the transverse gradients, which are very important in this branching system, sometimes can prevail over the other drivers of the uh, sedimentation. So there is the example of what is the critical uh, issues of the uh, how the uh, flood propagations occur in terms of the sediment patterns. The first thing that we, when we got some uh, reach without tributaries and the length of this reach on the graph is 150 kilometers almost, what's, what is on the left, on the left uh, picture of the slide. We will see that so when we go from the upper part to the downstream part, and when the river flow cross the big or uh, braided patterns of the uh, island vegetated areas, there is the constant decrease of the sediment concentration in the main stream. So the reasons for that is the same like with the delta area. So the more water is flooded on the surface of the floodplains, the roughness is increasing, and the sediments is captured on the floodplain lakes. And the empirical evidences of that on the largest rivers is the huge, huge uh, um, uh, layers of the silt after the floods, uh, which 
go through the flood plains. But another thing which is also important, which is, let's say, just observed, can be observed only we are such kind of application is the big difference between the floodplain uh, branches, small uh, sides areas of the water flow compared to the main channel. So the differences in the terms of sediment concentration is huge. There is twice difference of the uh, sediment passing these rivers. And uh, I will be back to this explanation later, this quite nice hydraulic explanation. And we have opposite situation on during the low water period when we have increase of the sediment concentration along the river. And that's uh, the focus and the, the, the answer what's, what's the reason for that is also the uh, possible side effects of the bank erosion or the erosion of the bottom. And we are aware of that, that the riffles are eroded during the, the low water period. So, but it is quite also typical to see the increase of the, uh, on the downstream increase of the sediment concentration. And then we can see that's very nice picture of the same reach for the high water period and the low water period. And you can see on the same area, this is the, if you're familiar with Lena River, this is the reach from the city of Pokrovsk. Here's the Yakutsk and here's the uh, mouth of the Aldan straight after the picture is uh, on the north is uh, ended. Up. And so on the high water period, there is the constant decline of the sediments in this reach. And on the low water period, we have constant increase of the sediments uh, in, the, in the system. Uh, and uh, this is also um, can be proven statistically that the sediment budgets under different discharges has the different uh, intervals uh, and the sediment budget here is again the difference between the average sediment concentration on the lower part compared to the upper part of the ridge. So, and this is the discharge. So you see that the larger discharge, the lower sediment budget, meaning that we are slowly going from the erosional system to the depositional pattern. And so there is the hydraulic explanation for that. We simply compare the uh, high resolution, um, um, high resolution grids of the flow velocities with the sediment concentration. And rather suddenly we came to rather significant correlation between the uh, velocity, surface velocity, and even bottom velocity with the sed suspended sediment concentration for the low water season. And then if we count the transport capacity, uh, we've also got the rather significant relationship between the sediment concentration and the uh, and the, um, uh, this transport capacity. So, and the number of points is not the issue to um, be unaware of the quality of results. So each point on the graph, on the previous graph is uh, thousands of the of the grid cells, because there was the huge grid cells, which was layered one to another one with the, uh, one is the sediment concentration, the second is velocity. <clears throat> and each box here is something like thousand of the points. <clears throat> so, and that means that it's quite significantly, or uh, significant relationship with the increase of the suspended sediment concentration uh, compared to surface velocities. And the third pattern is these transfer gradients. And uh, this is a specific issue, which is also sometimes very typical to the large rivers and which I've been showing in the beginning or is nice uh, or so-called wedding of the rivers. And this is uh, the downstream area of the Lena of the same ridge, but below the confluence of Lena and Aldan. And there is very typical uh, picture which can be observed from satellite when there is the two uh, um, uh, water flows of different suspended loads are formed and which can be mixed or can be going in rather large long directions. This is 200 kilometers length reach again. And this is the Viluri which is coming and uh, without any mixing, but if we try to count and we and we split geometrically split the river channel in the middle of this reach, just simply 
based on the weeds. And then we count the sediment concentration in this part and on that part. And then we will come to significant relationship, not, not significant relationship, but we'll have the evidence that's the, uh, that the sediments uh, relation the, the the ratio between the sediments in the left part of the channel and in the right part of the channel is the function of the uh, water discharge in both areas in both rivers. So and I would say that it is the end for the um, uh, discussion about the second uh, case study which is was focused in my presentation. And very briefly, I would say a few words about the third one, uh, about the system which is not so uh, well fits the previous uh, results. So, and this we are going to the top of the uh, top of the Siberia, and so we are coming to the another huge delta, the second delta of the world. The first is Amazon, and the second is the Lena River Delta. And this is the area of the big, big permafrost um, system and distribution. And the word permafrost is very important for us here because permafrost explain us that uh, hydrologically the sediment transport issues work in very different manner compared to the both Lennar um, on a branching channel, which we talked about before and compare, compared to the uh, deltas of the tributaries of Baikal Lake. So what does it mean? So it means that if we look on the imagery, we will see the very complicated system with impacts on the, uh, on the uh, sediment transport from different sources, both like uh, the coastal erosion, the bank erosion, and the deposition in the flooded lakes. And so uh, if we try to make the similar approach to count the sediment budget as a function of the water discharge for the Lena Delta, we would see quite sporadic picture without any um, real uh, clues that we, any evidences that there is some sort of relationship. And so, so the erosion and deposition can happen both in the, at large, at the floods, at the low, uh, uh, discharges and uh, that's quite we see that it's another story it's not fits the previous case studies and then if we go in more details and try to look what can be the reason for that we found that uh, elsewhere when we have the um, summer days on this uh, right part of the Lena Delta this is uh, Bukowska uh, branch we will, on many areas, we, we will note the increase of the sediment concentration under the exactly left bank. And then that's based on the literature and based on the, what we see in the area, we found that this area, this, this bank, exactly this left bank is uh, uh, located on the ridge of the river, which is flowing from the west to the east. So it's meant that it's northern bank of the river and we have the increase of the sediment concentration. What does it mean? It means that this is the permafrost thaw here. The thaw of the permafrost are bring a huge amount of the melt water with the sediments, with the clay and the, with the silt in the river system and this became the main driver of the um, uh, whole evolution of the sediment budget in the Delta of Lena. And this brings us to the idea to try to combine this uh, sediment budget with the air temperature. And uh, we see that there is some relationships between the air temperature and the sediment budget. And it means that the hypothesis of the impacts of the thawing permafrost on the sediment budget is in this area is working. It's the possible phenomena which explain the whole formation and transport of the sediments to the ocean. And then we came to the understanding that the new environmental drivers are, became crucially important. And even compared to the urban sediments, in this case, the uh, changing environment, the hydroclimatic development of the area uh, is the huge stressor for sediment budget. 
And then we come to the pictures that uh, give us some examples of how the sediments go through the system. And on this uh, slide, I would come to the conclusion, considering the time of uh, the lecture. And uh, I would firstly say that a few positive words about the uh, generally the applicability of the remote sensing techniques for to study the issues related to sediments uh, problems. And this is also compared to the issues of the, uh, in some way of the, uh, related to the quality of sediments. And there is few techniques which are available uh, to work with the sediment quality in this regard. And then that the seasonality is the key um, feature of the functioning of the uh, large river system is important. And it can be simply hydrological, which is worked with the, or is the function of the floods and the low water seasons. Or it can be that uh, the, the the function of the more complicated environments like the related to permafrost soil. And of course, these issues provide us with the understanding that the high spatial variability of sediment transport rates between a small and large channels in the such kind of bread system is very important. And this uh, further is a bridge to the monitoring strategy and to the big application in ecology. And so uh, before I finish, so we are still inviting all of international participants to our conference, which was shifted to then from 2020, like on, on the slide to 2021. And we are planning hopefully to organize it like normal conference or hybrid conference. Anyway, you are very welcome to register. And so uh, I just, I put this slide when I was looking on the last slide of my, of the previous speaker for my good friend Bjorn Helm. And actually, I put here the urban hydrology issue from Moscow. It's yesterday in Moscow, we measured discharge in these, uh, uh, let's say, very dirty uh, rivers with the huge amount of sediments. And compared to the atmosphere, which is it's my, it's my, also my good friend, Mikhail Samohin. And on the left slide, there is another picture from this summer from the Kolomar River. Uh, which is a completely different story compared to this Moscow environment. And it's uh, very, um, in terms of the uh, sediment and water quality, clean river and the beer is uh, the thing in the hands of my another friend, uh, Dr. Moreda is the thing which uh, also confirmed that this is the very um, different areas to study, but both of them are very challenging in terms of the, of the our uh, applications. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sergei. Very interesting presentation. Uh, very you uh, from uh, poorly known areas. Uh, so there are a number of questions uh, and uh, uh, some of them are here. So uh, first, uh, uh, there is not a question, but uh, uh, Mr. Abir Ben Slimanes thanks you for the presentation and the interesting subject. And then uh, is a question from a um, student of hydrology department, Moscow State University, Viktor Lomov. Uh, the question is, uh, is it possible to use uh, air drones instead of Landsat for the same goals? And maybe it will be more accurate than satellites measuring? Uh, okay, so thank for firstly the... Um, Thank you for convener to uh, lead the session. Thank you for uh, nice uh, feedbacks uh, in the in the question list. And so regarding the question itself, I'm I would say that the drones is uh, 
applied. And it's not the matter of accuracy in terms of the application of drones. It's the matter of the of the scaling and of the other, let's say, uh, resolution of the rivers to apply. So based on the drone technology, we are able to uh, apply uh, or to study rather small rivers with the also with the similar issues of the uh, sediment transport problems. And this, I would say, the first uh, possibility which brings out the drone itself. Uh, then th another point can be the studies of the maybe another physical processes like a turbulence based on the drone technology and the impacts of the turbulence on the on the sediment transport. It's quite challenging, new, and uh, there are another story. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the next uh, remark is from uh, Yossi Volson. Uh, great thanks to Dr. Chell for a very interesting presentation. And the question uh, is uh, to, to use uh, to use GIS for the treatment of obtained data and to state further research. Uh, do you use GIS? Of course. Uh, so actually, yeah. that's uh, the, the application of what we um, use. Mm, regular is the general RGIS software and so uh, let's say we the, the main results which I showed in the presentation were done in, in normal uh, in, in normal toolboxes of RGIS so we didn't use any specific uh, usually software for imagery so it's not sometimes the good point, but it's then more uh, relevant to combine our studies with another um, applications. And when we are working in the, on the interface between hydraulic and the, uh, this remote sensing applicability, then it's the GIS and like normally stri products is very useful. Mm -hmm. So anyway, thanks. Uh, okay, uh, then uh, what is uh, statistically significant of the relationship between uh, turbidity by satellites and in situ measurements? Uh, the Pearson uh, are sometimes is not enough information for such relationship. What can you answer? What is statistically significant? Uh, sorry, it's... Uh, yeah, in general, we use the, the correlation coefficient and we uh, assume that it's more than 0 0.7 is statistically significant. So we are not uh, making some very, uh, let's say, rough uh, calculations, so, but we're based on this quite uh, traditional criteria. This is the first thing. And the second, that we are not only focusing on pure statistics, we were also uh, worked with comparison between the uh, uh, imagery uh, images and the uh, on situ data with the independent uh, let's say independent observation which were not used for the uh, imagery for the um, processing of the relationship and uh, on the graph in the first part of my presentation there was the numbers of the errors which were up to 20%. And these errors were uh, assumed based on this, what I called, let's say verification. So we didn't make any, uh, we didn't use for the error estimation this uh, sort of statistics. We just simply compared the uh, observations uh, with the image based on the recalculated, based on the relationship which was taken from another field campaign. And this is a normal procedure, which I would say is just independent of what you are asking. So then I guess I answer a question in this regard. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, one more question from uh, Dr. Pankai. Uh, how close estimates to the absorbed date of sediment? How close estimates? Uh, how, close, how close estimates? Oh, uh, really? 
Actually, that, that's maybe I already uh, answered this question. So the, the, the difference is up to 20% in the, when we have the sediment concentration below 100 milligram per liter. So it means that we, uh, we can have an error in sort of the 10 to 15 milligram per liters, which in some way can be large, uh, but this is the error, which is a stochastic error, but it can be assumed like a large, but then if we talk about the um, uh, errors and the correctness of the monitoring and the uh, other typical traditional forms of the measurements in hydrology, so this is quite normal value, which is not uh, bad for such kind of the studies. Thank you. And uh, uh, two final uh, feedbacks, uh, I'd say. Uh, from, uh, first from Zara uh, uh would you mind to put your contact information? Um, we will announce on the, with the lectures, those of the speakers who will agree with the uh to share the contact information we will um, copy the recorded videos to the youtube channel with the contact information so i guess from my side it's okay so we'll ask all the other speakers as well okay uh, and uh, the general uh i think the feedback uh from uh all of the listeners uh it is uh, by Paulina Adamiak. Thank you very much, Dr. Chalov. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, just a moment. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, three minutes, so two more questions. I see uh, one is uh, from Miguel Ignacio Barrios. Uh, Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Chell. What kind of regressions could be reliable for these applications, classical models, machine learning? So we used classical models. And we never used for this kind of application anything else. And we used linear regression. And so we played with different other possible options. But the linear regressions as the classical uh, sort of the statistics works better in all cases. So probably, of course, that many things can be done in sort of the uh, developing uh, the technique of building the relationship. But yes, we use classical methods. Uh, one interesting question from uh, Mr. Fankai. Uh, humor. Uh, excellent study. I have a query how to take bad load proportion from satellite image. Uh, there is uh, so that's not uh, actually the straight uh, procedure so we never uh, did anything with the bed load techniques but if to speculate a little bit then we if we count suspended loads we can use a regional relationship between the suspended load and the bed load and then we can actually build some sort of the um, rock flow to count also to speculate about the bed loads. So, but of course, it's not the study what I was talking about. It's something else. It should be developed also theoretically. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, the final one from uh, Suvin Duroy. And uh, the question is, can we use your constant values, the gradients, the, uh, the relationship uh, between uh, reflection uh, value and uh, SSC in other rivers in tropical country. Uh, so I would say like that that we uh, there is some application of the similar um, technique which can be found in the literature, and I would say that uh, on Friday we will have a talk of Dr. Lad Bruce from Brazil, and he is uh, the one who published very nice. Uh, uh, paper on terms of the for Amazon catchment about the applicability of the or uh, similar approaches. So I think that uh, each river requires the um, uh, specific regional relationship, and for the tropical rivers it should be treated specifically. Of course, it's not the way method just to take the relationship and to bring it to another river system. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, okay, and uh, so the very last <laughs> question from Dr. Mutyanga from University of Zambia. Uh, are you open to collaborative research on sediment status? Studies? Are you open to collaborative research on sediment studies? We are always open. Russians are very open in different, uh, in different ways, also for research, for friendship and for everything. Welcome to Russia. Thank you, thank you very much, Sergei, and uh, thanks, uh, thanks to uh, everybody taking part in uh, this uh, session. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.